Welcome back everyone, it's Matimus, and thank you so much for joining me on today's video. Now, it may not look like it, but today we are talking about close air support, even though there's some beautiful tanks in the background here engaging. Close air support is one of those dynamics in the military that changes very, very often depending on the kind of conflict and the countries that are actually using it. I've got to admit, having close air support on my own operational tour in Afghanistan was a huge burden off mine and my company's shoulders when we were out in Afghanistan. I did have the Apache Longbow helicopter covering me and my company um, whilst deploying out there, and the A-10 Thunderbolt was also there to provide fire support if requested, and there were a number of times where we did have to call them in, along with the US Marines that attached alongside us at uh, FOB Edinburgh there. But to be honest with you guys, CAS is changing. It's always changing. It's ever adapting due to financial constraints, survivability, different platforms going out of service. For instance, the A-10, obviously, we know is going to be uh, continuing its service for a little while longer, but we will know that one day it will go out of service. The one thing that I have noticed lately, especially for smaller countries that have a limited budget and a limited constraint on you know, manpower and um, capabilities, is they've been looking for a close air support option that is not only very, very effective, but also quite cheap and very, very maneuverable for their forces, whether it be transportation of these things to a different area of the world or just the ability to get lots of them up in the air very, very quickly. So today we are talking about the future of light turboprop attack aircraft. Now, ironically, as I talk about this today, I actually work for a company that works for producing and procuring turboprop aircraft, so I know quite a bit about the aircraft themselves, so you know, this isn't exactly a subject matter expert video, but I do know a little bit about the aircraft themselves. In terms of a close air support role, let's be honest here, I've never had any of these aircraft support me, but it is coming into the spotlight a little bit more now, guys, and there's a number of key things that that is being brought into light because of. First of all though, when you talk about turboprops in a close air support role, most people get very, very upset thinking, well of course we don't need them, they're too slow, easily engaged, blah blah blah. They say it's a throwback, it's illogical, and they're normally the words that are thrown to describe close air support for turboprop and light aircraft uh, used for close air support. However, these aircraft are lethal, compact, quite inexpensive and really easy to support in the field, guys. Powered by a turboprop engine, which, as I said before, I work alongside quite often, it looks remarkably like the forebearers of the Second World War, the P-51 Mustang. They often inspire an emotional reaction that some people take when it comes to close air sport too. However, despite all the negative media and the negative response and bias that comes towards these turboprop aircraft, there are a lot of combat aviators out there that are extremely keen on bringing in the turboprop aircraft as a close air support role. This discussion of options for new airplanes is really no longer academic at this point. This summer just gone, the Air Force actually engaged in a light attack experiment at Holloman Air Force Base, which allowed for combat demonstrations like this which could not be carried out by other air forces since Vietnam. If you prepare to take the advice from individuals with no aviation background at all, this should worry you quite deeply. Now, as I said, I don't know enough about these aircraft to say this is my own personal opinion, this is what it should be, this is what it shouldn't be, but when you take a look at some of the comments and reactions of the aviation world of what they think is a good idea, it's something you've really got to take into consideration. But, if you are prepared to maybe listen to the professional aviators with a lot of extensive combat experience that haven't suddenly just lost their mind, it should become quite obvious that there might be some utility in using some light attack aircrafts. Certainly it has historical roots. In terms of the US military, the Navy, Marines and Air Force all used light attack aircraft in Vietnam. But just using the term doesn't really describe the aircraft very well, and the reasons to consider using them. Why should they pick a light attack aircraft? Well, light attack aircraft were pretty much just that. They're a small attack aircraft like the A-37 Dragonfly or the Navy OV-10, with significant weapon loads but not designed to stand up in front of the apocalyptic Soviet-NATO battlefield forces. 
basically guys these aircraft when they were initially produced and concepted they were not really there to engage large mass battles of tanks and armor and infantry just not what they're there for and the a-10 was there for that hence why it's continued to roll through the generations as being a close air support aircraft for the air force the long path to considering a new attack aircraft started in 2008 Faced with an increasing air power demand in Iraq and Afghanistan, the existing fighters were being wrung out to dry. They were just being used too much for what they were really needed for and to be honest a little bit of overkill. For the kind of air support we were providing for the US ground forces back in those conflicts, the existing F-16, F-15E and the Marine F-18 were a ridiculous overkill for the kind of situations that we were calling upon. Recall that by 2008, the Air Force and the Naval Aviation had been in continuous combat since January 16th, 1991. And honestly, now we are starting to see some of the strain showing in terms of cost and maintenance of these aircraft and continuing them to fly throughout more and more generations of combat aircraft coming out. Meeting air power demand with expensive high-end aircraft was the only option that the United States really ever had. And they were just flying to death. There was just so many sorties going out that these aircraft that were being used were not really designed to pull out these sorties like that all the time. And the thing is, they are still doing the same thing right now. But before the United States could really determine what a light aircraft could be, they really had to determine it at an air combat command level. A lot of aviators wrote a concept for the OAX, OA meaning observation attack and X meaning something that they didn't really have a number for yet, meaning it was experimental. They started with the historical examples, the aircraft they used to fight insurgencies in the jungle of Vietnam. The first example was the A-1 Sky Raider, a hulking behemoth of a plane with a massive 18-cylinder radial engine designed as a carrier aircraft and transferred to the Air Force in 1964 after the Navy retired them. Alongside the OV-10, the OV-10 Bronco, a new build, twin turboprop observation aircraft used as a forward air controller by the Air Force and as an attack aircraft by the Navy Marines. What the authors envisioned with the OAX was a modern turboprop aircraft with advanced sensors and precision weapons just like a modern fast jet. But they also wanted an aircraft that could forward deploy to austere airfields fueled from a 55 gallon drum setup and supplied from the back of a pickup truck. None of which a jet can do very easily at all. They also needed to be relatively cheap to buy and operate. In short, they envisioned an aircraft that looked a lot like the earlier designs with the weapons and sensors of a modern jet. However, these aircraft existed. There is the A-29 Super Tucano that has been in use in Colombia since 2007. Raytheon had a conversion of their T-6 trainer, or the A-T-6, that included a weapons capability. What we were looking for was the off-the-shelf, not needing a long development period type of aircraft. For combat operations in the Middle East, this seemed like a pretty good match. The aircraft that existed were two seeders, light armored, good day-night electro-optical sensors, guns, and precision munitions. Unrefueled, they had twice the loiter time of fast jets, and guys, this is one of the biggest, biggest things that CAS must provide on station support for as long as possible. And trust me, I know these aircraft that we're looking at right now, in terms of flight capabilities, they are very, very good at fuel economy and very, very good at being able to fly long distances, high altitudes and extreme speeds without burning gallons and gallons of fuel. In 2009, these aircraft could have flown from a dozen US-operated airfields in Afghanistan that could not have really supported fast jets. But making the case to an air force that has already been able to afford extremely high-end aircraft took a lot longer than expected. For instance, the Air National Guard tested the 86 from 2010 to 2014 and judged it, quote, operationally suitable and operationally effective, unquote. Ironically, it wasn't the combat capabilities of the aircraft that made the strongest case. It was the health of the rest of the fighter attack enterprise. Basically meaning, guys, if we can use these tiddly little things to do the jobs of what the old big guys were doing that are expensive to run, then why wouldn't they? A quarter century of continuous operations was wrecking the force. The majority of the high-end aircraft were just working way too hard for some of the roles they are being placed into. Operational readiness was actually some of the worst ever measured, and aircraft sustainment costs were ever climbing. And the Air Force had long since run out of people to fly in these aircraft. They were basically trying to get freshly graduated aviators and pilots to turn into seasoned fighter pilots very quickly. The F-35, as capable as it is, and we know it is, 
could potentially only provide a limited number of pilots and those not enough to absorb the new pilots to keep the force healthy. By 2016, the US were potentially short almost a thousand experienced fighter pilots and the shortage was actually getting worse. The Air Force was buying fighter aircraft at such a rate that it was going to take them 200 years potentially to recapitalize even the shrunken most post drawn down force. They needed to return to a healthy balance and that meant buying more aircraft. As the concept moved forward, forward into the planning and flying experiment of this summer, resistance mounted. Let's be honest, some objections were quite obvious and emotional. You know, a lot of people get very tucked into where they are with their comfort zone and many, many years of using the same thing over and over. Turboprops, at the end of the day, were old and they're older technology and suitable only for people too poor to afford the high-end cool fighter jets. The objections to turboprop were perhaps the most irrational though and the easiest to dispel with data that actually comes from utilizing fast air aircraft. A modern turboprop is a computer controlled marvel of engineering guys. I'm not even kidding you. These aircraft are incredible. They're not just a little turbo plane that has a little prop on the front. They are literally like a jet fighter with a prop and that's no word of a lie. And it is one of the most efficient aircraft power plants for the performance regime that it needed for the United States especially to operate in. It is extremely easy to maintain and very resistant to ingested debris and that could be expected at Ford airfields. Now, some of the other sort of contenders, I guess we should say, to replace some of the, you know, high-end fighters and such, is just like the one you're looking at right now. This is the Textron Airland Scorpion. It's an American jet and it's proposed for the sale to perform that light attack role. Also for intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance gathering. However, this is still quite an expensive option at $20 million per unit cost without support costs and weapon systems installed. That aircraft would be a good in the middle kind of ground aircraft for close air support. Not a turboprop but not fast air, kind of in between. Cost is always an issue when it comes to buying new equipment and these aircraft would be no exception to that rule. However, in terms of initial costing for these kind of aircraft, you're looking at a substantial drop. The United States Air Force has pretty much been looking for, like I mentioned before, back in the old days kind of requisition for the older turboprop engines. That being said, a lot of the light jet world said no way. They didn't care about fuel demand, they didn't care about debris resistance, cost and maintenance requirements, they can all get stuffed. Jets were new, turboprops were old, but no jet had the characteristics they actually needed in a power plant for an aircraft of this role. Other resistance relied on the panicked notion that the air defense threat would easily knock these things down. Suddenly the widespread wish you were dead air defense weapons would actually end the usefulness of light attack aircraft. Artillery is also exploding in terms of technological advances and some people even say that close air support really is not needed that much anymore which I will always disagree with. The funny thing is though, really good air defenses are expensive and have to be sustained and very few people slash nations can afford to buy these high tech radar guided threats, much less operate them effectively. There really are places and scenarios where air power is going to have a hard time operating but most of those places are really not affecting the US doctrine. It's not reasonable to expect that there will be a sudden surge of radar threats in places where violent extremists are the most firmly entrenched unless there are Russian or Chinese units nearby. So you can really be assured that the light attack aircraft are not really intended for th radar threat environment, more sort of the heat seeking environment, nor are they intended for the environment dominated by hostile fighter jets or fighter aircraft. Because let's be honest guys, that'd be just bloody stupid sending aircraft like that in those areas. The last issue deserves the real attention. Turboprop light aircraft are intended for lightly contested airspace where the primary threats are guns, shoulder launched heat seeking missiles commonly known as man pads. This is the environment that has dominated the threat airspace over Iraq, Afghanistan, much of Syria, Libya, Yemen, Somalia and almost all of the entire African continent. In fact in the last 25 years the US combat operations have involved 176 days spent in contested airspace and over 9400 calendar days outside of it. Counting simultaneous operations like the no-fly zones as separate events, the total number of permissive days exceeds 17,000 flights. That's the environment of which the US has really been using up their highly capable legacy fighter attack fleet and it's not going away anytime soon. It is highly ineffective when it comes to cost. 
Let's look at some other things that really would allow for benefits for these aircraft. They're quiet. It may not be obvious, but most gunners in an irregular warfare environment have to hear or see an aircraft to actually find it. They have no early warning system to feed them information. The experience with the AT-6 and A-29 on the training ranges are that they are quite actually hard to hear. By the time you hear them, you're in range of their weapon systems anyway. They are cool. Heat-seeking missiles rely on the signatures from exhaust or hot metal caused by friction with the air that they fly through. The exhaust of the A-29's turboprop, for instance, which is the exact same as the AT-6C, is mixed with strong prop wash, which isn't even hot enough to boil water by the time it reaches the trailing edge of the wing. The fastest moving part in the aircraft is the prop, which has to have a special equipment built in to prevent ice from forming. The exact opposite of a heating problem. Add into the ability of detecting missiles and dispensing flares, any aircraft would be less susceptible to heat seeking threats than any other fighter or attack aircraft in the infantry. They are small. Worst case, the AT-6 has less than half the exposed area of an A-10 when looking straight up at it. Best case, looking at it nose on, it presents an even smaller target. The A-29 is only a little bit larger than the AT-6, and it can still be said that it's hard to keep sight of your own wingman at distances where the larger jets maintain visual formation. Small size makes an aircraft much harder to hit with gunfire, particularly with the obsolete aimed by eye ex-Soviet anti-aircraft guns fielded by most insurgent groups worldwide. So overall guys, let's be honest, close air support in terms of a light roller tech aircraft make complete sense. If we can use these things for the task that some of the bigger, more expensive fighter aircraft have been trying to fulfill, it's a no-brainer guys, it really is, and that's why the US Air Force and the US military is experimenting so much with these aircraft and looking for potential new options for close air support in these roles, whether it be the AT-6, you know, the Super Tucano, all those sort of aircraft, or even maybe the Textron Scorpion. I gotta admit, I'm kind of impressed to see these aircraft going into more of a military role, considering I work in the industry, it's uh, quite important to me. Is it gonna happen? I don't think so. I think Congress has already spent way too much money on the F-35 program to even consider investing more money into this. It would be interesting to see if maybe in the long term future they're going to look into something like this, but I really don't think it's going to happen. Uh, the US Marines using obviously the Harrier and eventually the F-35. The F-35 is going to be doing the all-round roll again, but again, just exactly what I said before. Too much money being pumped into an aircraft that should be doing big roll tasks instead of these light roll, easy, quick, short in and out sorties for close air support. Just my 10 cents. Most of this information is just from my own personal opinion, but there are a couple of facts in there that I really do think there's a good selling point for bringing these aircraft onto the killing floor, so to speak, for close air support. Let me know what you guys think. Do you think these aircraft are worthwhile or just a complete waste of money, or do you think that the age of fast jets continuing to do close air support will last for a long, long time more? With the F-35, I must admit, I would agree with you if you do feel that way, but we'll see. So thank you so much for watching today, guys. I really appreciate it. I'd love to hear your comments in the comment section below. If you do wish to support my channel, go check out my Patreon account. It'd be much appreciated. And if you do want to come hang out and check out my Discord channel, then you come have a chat with me, play some games if you want in the future. Feel free to do that, too. Thanks again, guys. Have a wonderful day, and bye-bye.